Hello, my name is Jody Ferguson. Thanks for joining me today as I talk about World War II in the East Asia and the Pacific and potential ramifications of what's going on today. The reason I chose this topic was because this summer, beginning in May, we've been hearing a lot about 75th anniversary celebrations of the ending of World War II. On May the 8th, the United States and Europe and Russia celebrated VE Day, the end of the war, Victory in Europe Day. Coming up, you're going to be hearing about 75th anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And on August the 15th will be the 75th anniversary celebration of the end of the war in the Asia Pacific region. But the question I have for you today is, when did the war actually begin? When did World War II begin? People in Europe will generally tell you that it began on September the 1st, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. Russians will tell you it began June 21st, 1941, when Nazi Germany invaded Russia. Americans will tell you December the 1st. 1941, December the 7th, excuse me, when Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Some historians will tell you, however, that World War II truly began in August 1937, not in Europe, not in Russia, but in China. So what happened up until this time that caused the global conflagration to begin in East Asia? Beginning in the late 19th century, Japan and China fought a series of, of wars, if you will. The first one was in 1894-95, a very short war when Japan routed China, took possession of Taiwan, which was known as Formosa at the time. It also gained political suzerainty over the Korean Peninsula. Ten years later, the Japanese fought another war against Russia and gained further control of areas of China. Lingdao Peninsula, as well as the South Manchurian Railroad, in the province of Manchuria, north, northeastern China, which was the home province of the ruling Chinese dynasty at the time. In 1931, the Japanese decided to strike out and take control of the entire Manchurian Peninsula. And they installed the puppet emperor who was had been deposed by the Chinese 20 years earlier in the Chinese Revolution of 1911. In the West, though, there really wasn't much reaction to what was going on in China. It was referred throughout the Western press as the China incident. The League of Nations sent a commission to investigate what was going on in Manchuria and why the Japanese had decided to seize the province. But at the time, the League of Nations was a very weak organization. The United States, Soviet Union, and Germany weren't even members. When the League of Nations issued a condemnation of Japanese actions, the Japanese simply withdrew from the League of Nations and continued to be known as the China Incident. But in July of 1937, July the 7th to be exact, the Japanese attacked a group of Chinese soldiers at the Marco Polo Bridge, a bridge on the outskirts of northern Beijing, or Peking as it was known at the time, so-called because the bridge was described so captivatingly by Marco Polo and his annals from the 14th century. Japanese troops led by rogue officers attacked Chinese troops and began a general offensive in northern China, seizing the city of Peking, Beijing, and the port of Tianjin as well. Again, the reaction in the West was somewhat muted. It was still referred to as the China incident. And indeed, the Chinese troops, nationalist troops under Chiang Kai-shek, decided not to try and meet the Japanese with a full-scale attack after the Marco Polo Bridge incident. But what Chiang decided to do was move his forces south around Shanghai, and he decided to bring the battle to the Japanese at Shanghai. And on August the 13th, 1937, Shanghai became the fulcrum of the outbreak of the larger war in China, which eventually would lead to the outbreak of World War II. Chiang decided to take a stand against the Japanese around Shanghai and not further north for a variety of reasons. For example, Japanese troops were, be, were close to their main base of supplies up in northern China, 
in Manchuria, Chiang realized that he couldn't meet the Japanese head on there in Northern China, where they had an overwhelming superiority. He also felt that he had better political control around Shanghai, where local political leaders were loyal to him, where the terrain around Northern Shanghai was very marshy, hard for large armies to maneuver in. And lastly, and most importantly, I would argue, Chang decided to take a stand around Shanghai because it was the fulcrum. It was the main base of West, of the Western presence in China. It's where major international concessions were located. By Western concessions, I'm referring to British, French, American territories, small cities, towns all along the Yangtze River and along the Chinese seaboard. But Shanghai was the largest one. And there were over 100,000 Westerners, British, French, American, Dutch, and Russian citizens living in Shanghai. Western banking houses existed, trading companies, textile firms. Chang knew that if he brought the battle that the Japanese were at Shanghai, the West was going to have to sit up and take notice. Chang's wife, Sung Mei Ling, was actually an American educated. She went to Wellesley College in Massachusetts. She was American educated and she urged her husband to try and do what he could to bring the West into this conflict. So on August the 13th, Chang engaged Japanese troops in the northern suburbs of Shanghai, where he knew that urban warfare would play to their advantage. And if you see this photo, you can see Western citizens are up on the tops of their apartment houses, banks, hotels, looking out across Sutro Creek, which is a tributary of the Wangpu River. And the northern suburbs of Shanghai were the two large armies were fighting pitched battles. It's as if New Yorkers were standing on the top of their penthouses in, in Manhattan and looking across the Hudson River watching two armies fight in New Jersey. So Westerners gained consciousness of this war immediately. The next day, however, the day known as Black Saturday, the war truly came to the West. What happened on that day? Well, among other things, you could argue the first Americans died in World War II, not at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, but on August the 14th, 1937 in Shanghai. On that day, Japanese troops engaged in large scale artillery offensive in Northern Shanghai and began bombing and shelling innocent Chinese civilians, including this baby who, as you can see, his photo was taken of him in the wreckage of the train station in Northern Shanghai. Later that day, Chinese Air Force planes trying to, attempting to attack Japanese forces and more importantly, Japanese warships that were anchored in the Wangpu River right off of Shanghai, accidentally bombed the Western concessions. In the middle photo you'll see on this slide is the famous Cathay, the British run Cathay Hotel. Thousands of innocent civilians in the international settlement were killed during this inadvertent dropping of Chinese bombs when they were trying to hit Japanese troops. Among those thousands of civilians killed were scores of Westerners, including the four Americans that I alluded to earlier. Soon, you had a set piece battle all around Shanghai. Over 1 million Chinese and Japanese troops were engaged on what would later be referred to as the Stalingrad on the Yangtze, the first set piece battle in an urban setting in all of World War II. Chang's troops, German trained troops, as you can see in this photo here, wearing German helmets, Wehrmacht helmets, very interesting, fought very bravely for three months around Shanghai, but they were defeated ultimately by the superior Japanese forces. They sustained heavy casualties and the Chinese army, Nationalist Army, was never the same after this. Its best officers and best troops were killed. Subsequently, they withdrew up the Yangtze River Valley to Nanjing, Nanking at the time, which was Chang's capital, then withdrew even further leaving the city open to Japanese butchery and the infamous rape of Nanking that is so well known and 
history today in the annals of history is one of the most barbarous acts of World War II. Chang relocated his capital in Chongqing up the river, but now in the Western press, you no longer heard about the China incident. You heard only about the Sino-Japanese war. And then the famous photo of the baby that I showed you was taken and shown to over 130 million Americans in Time Life magazine because the owner of Time Life magazine, interestingly enough, Henry Luce was born to American missionary parents in China. And he was very pro-Chinese and he was going to bring the nation's attention through his long list of publications, Newsweek, Fortune, Time, Life magazine, and bring the West into this war. Let them know, the Americans especially, that they needed to support China. And Franklin Roosevelt, who, interestingly enough, his grandfather on his mother's side, Warren Delano, made his fortune in the China trade in the 19th century. He was also very pro-Chinese. Pearl Buck was a famous author at the time, and her best-selling novels on China were well-known by many, many Americans. This is when America decided that it had seen enough with the Japanese actions. The United States instituted a number of increasingly restrictive trade measures against the Japanese beginning with the tightening of the Export Control Act in 1938, the abrogation of the United States-Japan Commercial Treaty the same year. In 1940, when Japan attacked Indochina, which we know today is Vietnam, the United States imposed an embargo of steel and scrap metal, which the Japanese were very dependent on. In that same year, 1940, the United States sent it specifically to Pearl Harbor, and the United States closed the Panama Canal to Japanese shipping. The following year, Japan attacked further into Indochina, and the United States imposed an oil embargo, and the Japanese couldn't survive with that U.S. oil. And that's which ultimately led to the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the outbreak of war for the United States. But you could argue, and many historians have, that Shanghai was where World War II really began. This is when the West became engaged in the Asia Pacific region and in East Asia, where the West saw its first casualties in the war and where the West gained a greater understanding of the horrors that Japan was bringing into the Asia Pacific region. You could also make the argument that today there are some striking parallels to what's going on. You have a bellicose belligerent rising power in China just as you had in the 1930s with Japan. And the West, in the beginning, in the 1930s, was very slow to react to increasing Japanese provocations, attacks, and outright belligerence. We see the same going on today in the South China Sea with the Chinese grabbing territory. We see the same thing happening in the Himalaya Mountains where Chinese troops have engaged and battled with Indian troops. And we see it going on in the East China Sea, where Japanese planes and maritime surveillance craft are encroaching on Japanese maritime territory. So I think it would behoove you and the audience and in people in the West in general to sit up and take notice of what's going on in East Asia today, understand what happened in the 1930s, see the parallels, make your arguments or not that we could see East Asia again as the fulcrum for great power conflict. It could happen. But coincidentally, the other thing I want to talk about today is my book. I wrote a historical fiction novel which takes place in Shanghai. And the protagonist is an American correspondent who is documenting a lot of the same events and issues that I talked about today. The book will be published in September, will be available online and in bookstores. Meanwhile, go to my website, jodyferguson.com, check it out, read excerpts of the book, read reviews, read my blogs, my travel blogs, read my book reviews of other books, get to know me, my family, get to know why I began writing, and begin the journey to learn more about my book and about future novels that I hope to write. Thanks for joining me today. Have a great day.